<clears throat> Hi, this is Patrick Gilmore, and you can watch me on Traveler Season 2, December 26, 2017, on Netflix. And you're listening to my interview with Elaine Goodman at gogoodman.com.au. I read you discovered filmmaking while messing around with your dad's camcorder. What kind of things did you film early on? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I mean, I was probably 10, maybe, so whatever a 10-year-old found funny. Like, I remember finding some old beer cans or beer bottles that uh, were ready for recycling, filling them up with water, and then filming me and my buddy pretending to drink them and be drunk. And we thought that was hilarious. <laughs> and, uh, you know, shots of us jumping on a trampoline or uh, pretending to, to rob a bank, you know, being robbers and then we did that gag where you uh you exchange you know uh the arms of one guy with the other so you know he's not in control of his arms and we thought that was funny and it was just it was anything that we thought was funny but then i started watching the best of chevy chase live on on saturday night live um and i would recreate every sketch that he had just by myself just trying to get his timing down and I found him so funny, and I was just so curious why I, why he was making me laugh. So, was, yeah, without knowing it, I was going to school. So your kind of first and, uh, intro- introduction, your, your kind of first introduction to the entertainment industry was through comedy. Yeah, it was. You know, I mean, I, I loved like everyone. It was just laughing with your friends to the point where you would <laughs> you, you would see stars. And um, being able to make somebody laugh was was such a, a high for me. It was it was so gratifying. And uh, you know, my my brother introduced me to a lot of comedy. He's five years older than me, so I was watching John Candy and Joe Flaherty and all the SCTV cast and and Robin Williams and Bill Murray and these guys. They just they were gods to me. You know, Bob Newhart and his timing. And uh, and I wasn't intending to learn. It was just a way of, well, this is, I could make my friends laugh by using some of their their tools. So I would I would study this stuff just to make my friends laugh. And uh, uh, who knew I'd be making a living out of it <laughs> eventually. So that, that that's interesting. Before we get on to my next question, we're going to jump forward a bit. A lot of your credits, I don't think you have a lot of, comedy credits you have a lot of drama a lot of sci-fi credits to your name that i was looking at on imdb is it have have you ever like mm. have you always tried to find something funny or do you, do you like is there is there um, is there humor in every kind of genre oh well, that's interesting i i think what comedy teaches you is timing um that that's the backbone of all comedy is like music to me it there's a rhythm and there's a beat to it and i think that sort of knowledge will inform you on structure of other genres or other scenes like uh drama or drama and um and horror and any sort of anything else it's all just timing and rhythm um but there hasn't been a lot of opportunity for me to do comedy. Um, my my career has been uh, started in in, uh, in Vancouver, and Vancouver is a very sci-fi orientated industry. Uh, Canada, or sorry, uh, Vancouver isn't really known for for the comedy. It exists, but that's not what we're most known for. So, it's only been recently that I've been given the opportunity to to start doing comedy, and uh, it's. It's so fun because all these these little things that I've been using to make my friends laugh and and you know an occasional project here and there are starting to become how I'm making my living and uh, and I love it. I, I don't want to stay in comedy forever. Uh, I'd like I like to just kind of mix it up, but the opportunities that I do have, I will embrace and uh, and just. And see, I think that as long as I'm making myself laugh, I'm happy, which might not be a great business model. But <laughs> well, if fun. if you're having fun, then that kind of jumps over to the audience, and they can they know you're having fun, and then they're going to have fun. 
I hope so, yeah, because if, when you're watching someone do comedy and, and it's just, you know those movies you watch and you think, how did they get through that scene without laughing? Or, oh my goodness, they must have had fun filming that. Yeah, because That's there's, what I want. They, I did it like, they did it like 50 times. They had to retake it 50 times. Yeah, and how do they keep keep making that fresh? <laughs> it's, it's, the whole thing's an education, and it's, uh, uh, I'll take anything in comedy that, that comes my way. And the saddest thing is that there's no Oscar for, for comedy. Although it, it's a very kind of, I, it, it's it's hard. It it would be yeah, good. It really if, is. But it depends on the person's sense of humor. Like good acting is good acting, but good comedy it kind of depends on the person. Yeah, it's. I've never been able to really understand why some people are funny and some people aren't. Like, why is it that some people don't understand comedy? Or you know, you just see somebody trying to be funny instead of being funny. And the moment you see somebody try at anything it takes away the, the magic of it. Um, I mean, you see that in, in dramatic pieces, too. When you see them flexing every acting muscle they have, it removes that, that veil of that suspension of disbelief. You see the strings on the puppet, and, uh, and it takes you completely out of it. Comedy is the same way. When you see somebody trying to be funny, and I've been guilty of it, um, it... it it's not funny. It has to be seamless. It has to be real. The, the, the more real you make it, the funnier it is. So then let me ask you this before we move on, because I do have a whole sheet of questions, but I'm a big fan of comedy, of all kinds of comedy, and where it comes from and how people do it. So let me ask you this. When you were younger and you were kind of do, filming kind of funny skits off the top of your head, not scripted and not, not kind of prepared at all, just funny things that you found funny at the time, did that kind of did it kind of change your outlook on comedy when you started seeing comedy that was scripted? Did you understand that it was scripted, and how did you kind of adapt? Did you have to adapt your your kind of style with your friends or something when you realised that comedy can be scripted? These are great questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I've, I've got to, some thinking here. Yeah, no, that that well, that's that's my job, but I've got a whole sheet of questions. But yeah, this that's is just great. really good. Like, I'm a huge comedy buff. Like, I could talk about it for hours, but we don't have hours and I've got other questions yeah, because you've too. done other things. Because it's, like I said, yeah, no, I love talking about comedy. I could talk about it for an hour. But um, that's, that's a great question. I think the biggest revelation for me was just, just through trial and error because I would try things as, as a kid with the, the camcorder and see them fail miserably and well, that was funny in my head. Why didn't it come out like this? And a lot of it was because I was self-aware, and I was, like I said, trying to be funny. And how do you remove that? And I don't even know. I'm not even sure what that process is. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, like, what, what is your process for, for acting? And I couldn't tell them. I said, like, how do you tie your shoes? You couldn't. You couldn't put it into words. You just do it. It's something you learned years ago, and you do it without thinking. And a lot of my stuff is is that way, uh, to a to a fault. Because when you're trying to fix something and you don't have the language to to fix it, it's all just kind of uh, you know feeling your way blindly. But um, I'm not sure if this is answering your question. I'm pretty sure it's not. <laughs> I'm not quite. I'm not quite sure what I, my question was, but I. Just keep talking. We'll, well figure I think something I knew out. it was always scripted. I think, I think the comedy for me, I assumed was, I just assumed was was scripted. And I, uh, one of the, what opened my eyes in comedy was, was when you realize how much of it isn't written, isn't taught, is brought to you by the performer. I could write a joke and give it to you know ten people, and Nine times out of ten, it won't be funny, but that one time, it'll be funny. Why is that funny? Most likely, it's because of, of who's saying it and how they're saying it. And, uh, <laughs> and I could be wrong about all this stuff. But I'm it could just, also I'm be the person's comedy. profile. Like, if you give a joke to Eddie Murphy and if you give a joke to a homeless guy on the corner of some street in Melbourne, Eddie Murphy is going to be able to tweak it to make it funny. The homeless guy on the corner of some street yeah. in Melbourne 
isn't may not be able to do that unless they're like an undercover comedian. But that that's interesting that there it, because it is a lot of timing. It's a lot of kind of inflection, and it's a lot of like very specific language as well because some comedians strive on you. Yeah, Eddie Murphy will be able to. He'll be able to make that funny because he spent decades honing his craft on, uh, you know, on stage. You, the, a great, uh, a great documentary is the one that uh, Jerry Seinfeld made called Comedian. Oh, I watched that. It shows him posts. Have you seen it? Yeah, on Netflix. Yeah, I watched it. Yeah, and so he. This is after Seinfeld, and he's decided he's going back on stage, and you can see him trying out jokes smaller crowds before he does the big show and watches you can watch him fail you watch him tell a joke and it not land at all and him working on it going now why is it comedy is work and uh (laughs) but then then on the other hand i'm not sure if that's the same documentary i think there's two documentaries of jerry seinfeld on netflix now there's one where he has he fills up a whole street of all the little post-it notes of jokes that he's ever created. He has every single joke he's ever created. Now, some of them wouldn't have been funny at the time, but now that he's a comedian with 30 or 40 years' experience under his belt, he could make those first jokes funny because the audience kind of understands where they're coming from and who they're coming from because he has that comedy persona. Yeah, he's developed a language in a... a, uh rapport with the audience so we know that jerry seinfeld uh timing we mm. know how he delivers a joke it's the same you could say that with with every stand comedian from you know richard Pryor right up to ricky gervais it's you know <laughs> there are certain jokes only they can tell and put in the hands of somebody else they wouldn't wouldn't be funny yeah <laughs> i have i'm not sure which documentary that is that you're talking about but uh I'll definitely be looking for it. There's, yeah, there's two. There's one. It talks about like his early days before he got into Seinfeld, where he was just in bars and clubs, and how he got it, how he got on the Tonight Show, I think, as well. It's like his early, early days. It's before Seinfeld. Yeah, I, I actually think yeah. it's called Jerry before Seinfeld. Okay, yeah. So that's something different. The one I was yeah. talking about is just called Comedian. Yeah, there's a second but one. What on I love there. is listening to these interviews with uh, stand-up comics. And they talk about how they got started. And they all have very similar stories where they have, like, the Bill Cosby record or the Bob Newhart yeah. Down Man record. And they, they would listen to it over and over and over again and try to understand, why is that funny? Why is this working? And they have it memorized until they have that, that metronome, that beat uh, that these stand-up comics have. And then they develop their own uh, rhythm and style. But it's understanding the music of comedy that that is the gateway. Once you hear that music, <laughs> it sounds so metaphysical, but once you hear the music of comedy, it's it's addictive. You you, it's like a song that you, that that you can't get out of your head. And I mean, my girlfriend is uh, is a prime example of of me trying jokes and constantly try, making cracks at everything I can. And it probably gets annoying as hell, but it's. It's part of me working out what's funny, what's not, what makes me laugh, and uh, and what I could possibly use while I'm working. <laughs> oh, I do that for fun. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it doesn't feel like work because, <laughs> you know, it's just I'm making myself laugh, and that's my favorite pastime. Um, but, like, that's a, a popular one for comedians that I've interviewed. I've interviewed quite a few comedians. The one, I uh, can't remember what it's called, it's Eddie Murphy where he's wearing the red leather suit. Oh, it's either raw or delirious. Yeah. Delirious, yeah, yeah. Eddie Murphy, delirious, delirious. Is that what it's called? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a popular starting point for a lot of comedians that I've interviewed, especially like African comedian yeah. comedians, but also um, Australian comedians as well. That that's a popular starting oh, point across the board. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm dating myself, but you know, there was no Netflix, there was no internet when I was growing up, so I had Betamax. And I had... Is that uh, like a Sega? The best of Chevy <laughs> Chase. It was like VHS and Beta. But like Beta a, was so much better. A, but Atari? Anyway, <laughs> I had the copies. <laughs> yeah, around that era. Uh, I had the best of uh, uh, Chevy Chase, Saturday Night Live, the best of um, 
Eddie Murphy Saturday Night Live. I had a Robin Williams live in San Francisco. I, I can't remember the exact title of that one. And I had uh, I even had an Andrew Dice Clay one, which I kept hidden from my parents because it's young. There was a lot of <laughs> <laughs> horrible he's, language in it. He's come but out of the woodwork I recently. Oh, he's got a great show. Yeah, what is it called? Dice. Yeah, yeah. I want to watch talented, some of his but stuff. But he had yeah. timing. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's not to everyone's taste, but here's a guy that could come on stage, not say a word, light a cigarette, smoke the cigarette, just staring at the audience and have everyone in stitches, and he hasn't said a word. That's, that's power. That is timing. That is, that's magnetism. I mean, regardless of, of whether or not you're a fan, you can't deny that there was thought and talent put into this. But then how do you create so that I, persona? I, I like, how do you create that persona? Because the first time Andrew Dice Clay would have gone on stage, if he would have lit a cigarette and just stood there for five minutes not doing anything, people would have got bored. How do you create that persona yeah. where he can do that and b- make people laugh uncontrollably? Oh, shit. Confidence, number one. <laughs> uh, but trial and error. I bet you there were times with his friends where he, you know, he could only get to 10 seconds of smoking a cigarette and having them laugh before they said, all right, knock it off. But uh, it's it's all being able to read that audience and hear that that music, knowing that the the, the key is about to change, that that beat is going to hit any second now where it's not going to be funny, and being able to to just switch gears right on the note and and get that laugh, and then you get into the whole. Uh, and I, I know there's a name for it. I can't think of it. But, you know, Family Guy does it perfect where they hold off on one joke and they keep, you know, like when Peter trips and hits his knee. Yeah, and he's like, and he just starts going, ah, 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 ah. hilarious. Yeah, 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 yeah right. Not. It goes too far. And then it goes a little longer and it becomes funny again. And that's, that's a whole other conversation about confidence <laughs> in, in knowing what you're doing with comedy. So, that's all I've got time. No, I'm kidding. I've got heaps of questions here. So, I, I think we better move on because I do have a whole interview here and I'm right. assuming you've got to work at some stage in the next week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. So, you're <laughs> now we're going all the way back to the start. You're a born and bred Canadian and currently live in Vancouver. Is it hard to maintain a career in film and TV when you're not living in or around Hollywood? Um... Canada, not really. No, Canada has a really healthy film uh, industry. And I will say there is a point within Canada where you can plateau and your career will only get that high. Um, We don't really have a star system that uh, the Americans do, which I think kind of hinders us from... from, um, I don't know, bigger things, but a lot of our, our biggest talents and biggest names end up, of course, going across the border and, and finding work there. For me, I, I don't have uh, a family here um, in Vancouver. I, I moved to Vancouver to work from Edmonton. And uh, I have my green card, so I, I can work in the States. And it's it's more of just opening up different possibilities, different uh, productions, different opportunities, and, and why not? If I, if I can, uh, I think everyone would. Um, but there is enough in Canada for you to have a career, and there's quality productions, and the crews here are some of the world's best film and television crews. Uh, and there's a reason why you know, a lot of American productions come up here, and it's not just tax credit. Uh, the crews here are just phenomenal, as well as the, the, the locations. So you can have a career without going to the States, but why limit yourself if, if you have access to it uh, and the opportunity? And Yeah, I know a, a lot of like action movies film up in, up in Vancouver, actually, anyway, so... Yeah, yeah, a lot of, like, you know, Deadpool, I think, just wrapped up, and... Uh, uh, Deadpool 2, rather, and The Rock just finished a movie called Skyscraper, or else they're still filming it. I mean, there's so many huge productions that come up here. But there's also, in Vancouver, 
you know, anywhere between five and ten casting directors. And in Los Angeles, there's, you know, well over a hundred, if not hundreds, I don't know. So, <laughs> you know, why not tap into something that, where you can play different roles, be on different shows, have access to, to, to different actors that you can work opposite of and, and learn, you know? Um, yeah, it's it's uh, if if you have the opportunity, why not? You currently play David Mailer on the Netflix series Travelers, alongside Eric, Eric McCormack, who also plays plays Will Truman and Will and Grace. I've got a question about him in a, in a few questions time, which now I know you'll have a good answer to. Tell me a bit about the series because it sounds quite complex. Uh, Travelers is a, a sci-fi show about time travel, and it takes a a, a different approach to time travel than you've seen before, uh, wh- while still paying homage to some of the classics, you know. But uh, it's it's almost a cross between. Oh man, I set myself up for <laughs> for an analogy I can't complete. Say back uh, to the future. It's almost like back quantum leap. Sorry. <laughs> it's almost like quantum leap mm-hmm. in that. The bodies of the people remain. It's the consciousnesses that are, are being transferred into uh, into people in our present day. But the whole show takes place in present day. So these travelers have come from hundreds of years in the future to maintain a course of history that will lead to a better future than they came from. And um, it's as much about time travel as it is about the lives that these people inhabit and the people in their lives when they love and interact with in present day. And that's where I come in. I'm, I'm, I know one of the, the bodies <laughs> that has a time traveler in it. And I don't know that there's a time traveler in it. So it's, uh, there's so many roads to go down. We've done two seasons. I know that there's stories for, for seasons past this one. And hopefully we get the opportunity to, tell them because we're just tapping the surface of, of the world building of this of this universe that's, that's that uh, inter- Brad Wright has created. That's interesting. So for things like Back to the Future, they go back in the past back in the past to correct the present. You've you've got in, in Travelers, it seems like the characters are coming from the future to make the future better. They're coming from the future to the present yeah. to fix the present to make a better future. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's like okay, so here here's how I can finish that. Quantum Leap meets the Terminator. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, but we don't know what the future is that they've come from. We 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 reference it. There's certain hints if you if you're a real student of of the show, you can kind of get an idea of what this future that they've come from looks like, and it's it's dire. Everything's under ice. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're they're living in in shelters and uh clearly it's it's so bad that they've had to create this technology to to come and write come and write what once went wrong to quote quantum leap what do you like about being in in a netflix show as opposed to a week by week network uh network show uh, netflix just has uh has their finger on the pulse of what people want to watch and they they allow the the creative teams behind these shows to to uh, to follow their vision. There, there's not a lot of interference uh, on that part, but they they have access to homes around the world. I don't even know hundreds of countries, or, or well over a hundred countries, uh, have access to, to Netflix. So it's just it's more eyes on the show. Um, a network. You know, like uh, NBC, ABC, CBS, what have you, Fox. Uh, that's only kind of an American market. But Netflix is worldwide. So, you know, I get messages from people in, in Brazil and from Russia and all across the world who have seen the show. Well, one of my favorite things, I've, I've received messages from the actors who voice my character in other languages. <laughs> that's kind of a cool thing but there's just it, it's a market that I've never been able to uh, 
been a part of and around the world. It's, it's, it's mind-boggling how many people are, are watching Netflix. And I just, I'm, I'm so grateful and honored to be a part of it. I'm, I'm super lucky. Is it weird having six months of work put on Netflix in one hit? Yeah, that I haven't gotten used to <laughs> because it's typically a once a week sort of thing. And so, which kind of allows you to go, hey, do you enjoy that episode? Here's a couple facts about that episode. Here's some photos about that episode. But with Netflix, it's just bleh, the whole thing gets dumped. And, and you're the getting bleh. people like a, you know, last Christmas, you know, within hours, what felt like hours, it's probably like, you know, noon. Uh, of the day it was released, people have watched the entire season. They binged all 12 episodes in one sitting, and I'm going, oh my God, I can't wait for season two. And I'm like, you've only had season one for 12 hours. <laughs> like, you're going to be waiting a while here, bud. Yeah, that's, that's, and, that's uh, a crazy thing. I'm expecting thing. the same thing this year. Then you get people bugging you online, when's the next season coming out, when's the next season coming out, and you can't tell them anything because it has a, the contract hasn't even been signed yet. Yeah, there's not even a go yet, but you haven't even appreciated the first season. <laughs> You've only had 12 hours to sit with it. Watch it again. Um, you might have missed something. <laughs> me, yeah, watch it again. Enjoy it. For me, like there are shows and podcasts and things that I love that I love so much I won't watch it all at once. I need to just dole it out <laughs> in small pieces so that it lasts until the next season. But people are crazy for Travelers. They just... they. <laughs> I fully expect on December 26th at noon to be hearing from people saying that season was fantastic. When is season three? Yeah. <laughs> well, we might be waiting a while. Oh, but... God, I can't. It, it'd be crazy. Uh, it's such a weird, weird way to. Um, I under as a fan, I understand it because you know there's that whole oh one more episode, one more episode. But from the actors and the production side of it, it's, it's weird to think that six months of work is just dumped all out at once and people have watched it, judged it, reacted to it, commented on it all within hours. So then weird. do you think if Travelers was a, was a network show, do you think it would still get the same reception if it was a week-by-week -week show? Uh that's a good question because the audience's tastes are changing. Jeez, I'm on I fire today, work. aren't I? Absolutely, but <laughs> what's that? I'm on fire today, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not asking standard questions. It's great. You get me to think. Um, but this, the, I think for network, it's more of a, you know, monster of the week, uh, a procedural kind of platform. It doesn't really, it's it's not really suited for binge-watching and serialized television. It, it it has worked. I mean, some of my favorite TV shows, like Lost and West Wing, all kind of, uh, Lost more so, uh, serialized. Uh, it's more torturous to have to sit there, like when 24 came out. Do you remember when 24 first came out on TV? And we were just like, oh my God, how am I going to get through this week? Which is exciting because there's that anticipation. But uh, I think, yeah, I think that the, the tastes of the audience now are, are completely changed. They want it, and they want it now. And if they can't get it from you, they'll get it from somewhere else. So you might as well give them what they want. And that defeats the whole idea of what the 90s was with must-see TV, which is what I've j just recently read a book all about. Mm. And Eric McCormack was a part of that. Yeah. Yeah, the, the whole water cooler thing of Friday morning after th the Thursday night NBC lineup was such a cultural pivotal touchstone that doesn't exist anymore because I will have watched the entire season of this show <laughs> and the other, you know, everyone else at the office, not only have they not watched it, they might watch it months from now because it's always available, but they're probably watching one of the 10,000 shows that are on that you haven't seen. And so they, we're, there's like ships passing in the night. So thank God for the internet where the people that have watched can gather around the proverbial cooler and find people in Vietnam that have binged that show in 12 <laughs> hours like you have and you can talk about it. So it's so like the, a, it's the a, water cooler, maybe it still exists, but it's, you know, online now. It's a cyber water cooler. 
Yes, a cyber water cooler, exactly. <laughs> so, and this is the question that I think you'll have a good answer for. I know Eric McCormack from Will and Grace. I'm assuming, being the comedy buff that you are, you may have seen a few episodes of that show too, and it's even come, like, it's even rest- restarted, it's come back. Is it strange working with an actor that yeah. you know from such an iconic sitcom in a completely different genre and show, or is it just part of being an actor? Uh, it was weird the first time I got to act with Eric. Uh, and we've only had a handful of scenes, but those scenes that I have with Eric are some of my favorite. And I look forward to the most because uh, I get to learn from him. He's, he's a master of timing um, because he's, you know, he's an icon of, of sitcom television. I'll tell you the, the part that really impressed me was by the end of season two, he's no longer Eric McCormick. He's just Eric. He's my buddy Eric. And I know how he works. I know who he is. It's, it's just another part of the job and life. But the exciting part was when Will and Grace came back and I watched that first episode. And here's my buddy Eric doing a style of comedy that, that I haven't seen him do in, in a decade, like a decade. And doing it so well and seeing his techniques and being able to, to be that, that sitcom broad style of acting, nailing it. He's so talented to be able to do that and then come back and do something as, as gritty and smoldering as uh, his character on Travelers. And still be able to be funny on Travelers, but in a completely different energy and style. That's something I don't know if I can do, um, and I, I'd love the opportunity to try, but to be able to be <laughs> that talented in two different genres, I think it's obnoxious. I think he has too much talent, and he should share some of it. See, and it, it, it's strange in that he's playing a new character on Travelers that has only been created over the last year or year and a half or so, because it's only almost like two seasons in now, but Will Truman, he's picked up after playing that character for, what, seven or eight years, having a break from the character for ten years, and then going straight back into it, does he have to retrain himself to yeah. play Will Truman, or is it just there naturally? Knowing Eric, I feel like he slipped on it, slipped into it like riding a bicycle. I don't think that he forgot how to do it at all, because as a as a person he is naturally very sharp very quick and he's a theater guy i mean he 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 was born and bred in the theater so that's that's more of his style which is what will and grace is i mean it's theater and uh when you surround yourself with the high caliber talent of deborah messing and megan mullally and, and sean how do you not you know, uh, how do you not, how does that not get pulled out of you in a, in a very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? But just, yeah, I, it just, like you, you, you rise to meet it and you yeah. exceed it. And that's what Eric does to the point where he got nominated for a Golden Globe this year. And it's well deserved. The man never stops working. And so when he stepped onto the, the stage for Will and Grace for the first time, I think there's interviews where he said it, that he just, it was like going home again. It was uh, it was quite easy. I read that the role of David Mailer was created for you. How does that process happen? Did the writers or producers know about you beforehand, or did you do an initial audition first? Or an initial audition? Well, the creator of the show is Brad Wright. And Brad Wright uh, was the man responsible for bringing Stargate to television. And in the third incarnation of that series, Stargate Universe, I was lucky enough to be on that for two years, and I got to know Brad quite well. And Brad and I have very similar sense of humor, very similar senses of timing, and he knew my voice. So after Stargate was canceled, you know, we kind of said our goodbyes and went off to, to follow our careers. And from what Brad tells me, you know, while he was writing Travelers, whenever David Mailer would come up, he kind of did it in my voice. And uh, and had hoped that I'd be able to play it. I still had to audition for it, but um, there's nothing 
more, it's such an honor. I, I can't even put it into words what that meant to me, that Brad was just thinking of me, let alone cast me in it. And uh, it's, really, it's really fun when you get a script and you read the dialogue that you're meant to say, and it makes sense to you, and it's, it's so in your wheelhouse, you can hear yourself saying it, so much so that that part of the work is done, making it real is done. Now you get to, to spend your time and your effort honing it and making it even, you know, even fit. Just, just, I don't know how I put it, not make it funnier, but to make it concentrate on different parts of your craft. Because and make the, it more the believable. job of making the dialogue... Well, yeah, it, you know, because sometimes you'll get a script and you'll go, how the hell does, do you say that? How the... How does this? How do you make this dialogue sound real? Um, because not every script is going to be you know, Citizen Kane. But with Brad Wright, he has such a grasp of storytelling, and the fact that he's writing in my voice, that part of the work is is already taken care of. Now I can concentrate on other parts of of the performance, and that's that's been such a gift that you know I might not ever get again. But uh, it's it's like going. It doesn't. It's this. This doesn't feel like work at all. The work is the audition. Everything else is just candy. Ah, <laughs> oh, the sugar problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, people, people, as you mentioned, people Paul, might also know you from Stargate Universe. You played Doctor Dal Vol, uh, Volker, and you're one of the. Th- uh, of the three people who have been in all three series of Stargate, is the pop culture fandom something you've seen going on around you? Well, yeah, it kind of comes part and parcel with, with sci-fi. I know uh, there's there's friends of mine in the acting community here that have done just a handful of sci-fi episodes, and they can go to conventions and interact with the fans because they're... Sci-fi fans pay attention. There's a... There's a lore behind every sci-fi show, which you don't get in other genres like procedurals and medical dramas and, and police shows. But in, in sci-fi, there's immediately a, you know, like with Travelers, I don't know how quickly, but after season one, definitely, there was a Travelers Wikipedia site. Not a Wikipedia page about Travelers, but like a Travelers wiki. Uh, you right. go. <laughs> And learn about every character and every actor and what they've been on, and and they the fans interact with you and they it becomes so much like theater in that the, the response and the interaction is immediate, and you don't get that with any other genre. So I will be forever grateful that my career started in in sci-fi and continues to to, to touch on sci-fi because of these amazing people that you meet online and they will support you and follow you and appreciate what you do. In, in other genres, if you do, did like a cop show, you could, you know, work for years and that's all that stuff's out there and you might not hear from people and you, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that you're doing something right and that it's appreciated. And with that sci-fi pop culture, and it just seems to be getting stronger. It seems to be becoming more mainstream with, you know, Star Wars kind of on the back on the front and Marvel and DC. But uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And that, that you bring up a, a strange point, which is kind of like a, a side point. Back when I was growing up, and even when you were growing up, your parents probably would have told you never talk to strangers in the street or anyone on the computer, don't give out any details, never talk to somebody you don't know. Now... Like, everybody talks to, quote-unquote, strangers on the internet. As long as you don't give out your, like, bank details, address, phone number, date of birth, whatever, you can find groups on Facebook yeah. that you can fit into more comfortably than you can fit into groups in everyday life. Yeah. I bet you there's a, a, a age divide where our generation is a little more withholding on the internet than the, internet, the, 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 the generations that have grown up with the internet. Uh, because we have that mentality of of not trusting strangers, maybe, <laughs> and not not having access to. I mean, can you imagine? I always say that if YouTube existed when I was in junior high and elementary and what have you, 
I would be unemployable today because I'm sure I would put something up there of me, you know, <laughs> in university throwing up in a back alley thinking it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. And future employers would just have to <laughs> Google my name and, and see a drunk Patrick making an ass of himself and not hire me. Thank God that I was old enough to understand the implications when uh, the Internet came up. But uh, it's tough it's tough now because I am kind of guarded with, with my privacy and my family, and yet I have to still interact. It's part of the job, and it's it's fun, but I'm, I'm very conscious about, you know, keeping my private life private and uh, and not giving out too much information. But it, it gets harder and harder because social media and and just the culture that it is today is very uh, invasive and um it's it's a bit of a dance to to kind of maintain your public profile in your private life. So you're you're probably in that kind of gap where you're still young enough to appreciate social media and YouTube and everything like that, but you're kind of old enough to know that you still have to be careful. So is that is that gap big? Yeah. Um it might be bigger for me than some of my friends my age because I'm I'm a bit of an old soul, you know. Like I'm in bed by eight thirty every night. And, uh, <laughs> that's I'm because you've got Netflix. Clubbing, but the... <laughs> that's right. I got all the friends I need on Netflix. Yeah, you don't. You don't go to um, sleep till two a.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm in bed by eight. Is the point? No, um, no. In yeah, today's age, I, that's I'm not the point. Young enough... <laughs> I'm still young enough to to see the fun in it and see the uh, the other applications of of social media. And uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm not like, you know, my parents who, who just were just now getting onto Instagram and still think that, who have now since taken over Facebook, my mom and all her friends. Um, so, no, I, I, I get, you know, I understand how Snapchat works. And, I, you know, I had to learn. It doesn't come naturally to me as it does to teenagers now. But um, oh, I still don't get Snapchat. How old did I just down there? <laughs> Really, it can be fun, but Instagram kind of gives you what Snapchat gives you. So I, I don't spend as much time on Snapchat. But there'll be other platforms that come out that I'll have to learn, and will offer something different. And uh, it's part of my job to to be on top of that. But I can still appreciate how fun they can be. Yeah. See, I don't think you can count going to bed as the time you go to sleep anymore because you can sit in bed and watch something on Netflix for two hours. <laughs> It just doesn't count. I know. That's so fun. One more episode. One more episode. Exactly. Exactly. Five more minutes and then a big explosion happens. You've got to find out why that big explosion happens and who was in that big explosion. And then you can be watching for another 20 minutes. And then by that time, yeah. you've got to get up and go to the toilet. And then you're up for another five minutes. And then you've got to let the dog out. And then you've got to go back right. to bed. And now you can't go back to bed because you've turned all the lights on trying to let the dog out and go to the toilet. <laughs> Exactly, and before you know it, it's noon on December 26th, and you watch all of season two of Traveler. Exactly, and you haven't slept in four days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, did you did you go through a phase where you were going to pop culture conventions and meeting fans and taking photos and signing autographs? Um, after Stargate, I did two conventions. I went to Dragon Con, and I did a... Stargate convention in London for a weekend. Mm. Uh, but that was, I think, 2011. Oh, my God, that was six years ago. Uh, <laughs> See, and, you've been awake watching Netflix yeah, that whole time. <laughs> yeah, I've been a little preoccupied with the Ozarks. Um, I, uh, I love Dragon Con because I was a fan more than I was working. The Stargate convention was, was so fun, but it was, you know, it was, it was work. And when I was at Dragon Con, there was work involved, you know, there was meet and greets and panels and signing autographs, but it wasn't strictly Stargate. So I got to meet Ernest Borgnine and Martin Landau and see the cast of WKRP in Cincinnati. And so as a fan, it was, it was super fun for me. Um, but other than those two, I haven't, I haven't done any conventions. Um, I'm sure opportunities will come up 
And that'd be fun because I know a lot of my friends go to Australia for conventions. I've never been to Australia. I think that would be a, that'd be a blast. But um, I, uh, I I don't know how comfortable I am. Being the center of attention. Online is, is, yeah, that, that makes me uncomfortable, and I get kind of sketchy in, in crowds. But interacting with fans online is, is one thing, because I can always turn off my phone and retreat to my, <laughs> my fortress of solitude. <laughs> At a convention, it's, you're more exposed, and uh, like I said, I, I get, I get kind of weird in, in, in big crowds. And uh, <laughs> it'll happen. I'll be at conventions. I, I'm sure it'll happen, but, uh, and I'll deal with it. It'll be fine. You might, you might have to. Yep, you might have to bring your mum with so she can point out all the Facebook users. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. My mum would be more in tune with that. <laughs> but that's weird. Like I used, like I am a big convention guy. I volunteer at a lot of conventions, but unless there's someone I really want to meet, I one. Well, I won't spend the money because one, they're getting quite expensive for photos and autographs, and two, you only get to spend less than a minute with them, and that is, I'm saying to get yeah. to an age where that's kind of starting to seem a bit pointless for me, because you don't really get anything out of it. You don't learn anything about them. You don't get to talk to them much at all if they've got a big line. So I go because I I like yeah. the convention atmosphere rather than going for a, a specific guest. Yeah, and that 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 goes to one of my issues with conventions is I don't understand them. Um, <laughs> not that I don't. Yeah, you get Snapchat. I don't understand you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> we speak different languages, <laughs> but I, I've never been one for autographs. I even when I was a little kid and I would get somebody's autograph, I would look at it and go, "Well, now what? <laughs> what am I going to do with this autograph?" Like, yeah, I, I much prefer a photo. It's proof that you met them, I guess. But I don't understand autographs. Not that I won't give autographs. I just I've never been one to want them myself. So I there's a disconnect there, and I can't think of many celebrities and public figures that I would go out of my way to spend money on to meet. If they're there, fantastic. Like the other day, I uh, I went to my buddy's. Uh, a buddy and I went to. Uh, the fan expo here in Vancouver. And I reluctantly went because, again, I crowds, not good in crowds. So I went and I saw uh, the Fawns. Yeah, Henry Winkler. Um, Henry Winkler. And I, 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 got, I got all kind of fanboy and I was so excited. And I went up and I asked the lady, I'm like, can I meet him? Absolutely. So I went and got my photo taken with him. And the point is, is that I, I can't think of many people that I would want to spend my vacation money on <laughs> to go meet. And so when someone has done that to meet me or my castmates, I, I don't quite understand it because <laughs> my, my autograph isn't worth anything. And I, I, I don't, there's just a disconnect there, but uh, yeah, I don't know where I was yeah, going either. And as I get older, I'm learning there's a, big difference between meeting someone and actually getting to have a short conversation with someone, which you don't really get to do at conventions, which is kind of what I'm good at. No. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you, you almost have more access to them through Twitter if you private, yeah. if you, you know, message them. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's all part of the culture. And, and again, that's something that other genres don't have. And, and I get it. Now, the last few questions okay. don't really have much structure, but they're just a few interesting things that I found out about you, so we'll see how they go. Okay. In 2009, okay. in 2009 you were in a movie called 2012, and the whole world was almost convinced Earth was going to completely cease to exist by the end of 2012. Is there a responsibility yeah. in, of, of Hollywood not to absolute scare the bejeebas out of the entire planet by making a movie about the world exploding? Is it a responsibility for Is it a, Hollywood not to, to scare not the, scare, not the, to the, scare the crap out of people? Like, in a way that they no. may not be able to recover? No. No, I mean, if, if, if it's that scary, don't 
don't go see it, but there is going to be a market. There's going to be an audience for every type of horror, and that's why I'll point you to the movie Human Centipede. Oh I've never God! Seen it. I, I yeah, no I want I want to see it. No, I I, I I actually this is funny. I watched the Human Centipede and the Human Centipede Two. There's three on Netflix at the moment. I can't be bothered watching the first one. The the, the third one. The first one was okay. Like it's a bit pointless. It's it's a bit stupid. The second one was just plain absolute rubbish. It was in black and white, and there was no dialogue at all. But the first one, it it was okay for a little bit before. It, like I'm not creeped out by a lot of things yeah. because I've had different health issues in my life. So I'm not creeped out by blood or human body much at all. But it just seemed like, why do you create that? Who, think, who thinks of that idea? Why is that an idea? Well, and that was my reaction when I heard the premise for the movie. Yeah. And yet, it was popular enough that they've done two sequels. So, no, there's, there's no responsibility for for the entertainment industry to kind of be the uh, the curator of taste. Because <laughs> when you say, ta- can, can we not put the human centipede and taste in the same language? Because it has a few different <laughs> right, entendres. Okay. There's, there's a few entendres uh, there that I do not want to explore. Yeah, sorry about that. No, <laughs> uh, I I say, uh, you know, I mean, that that's, that's art. It's pushing the boundaries to see what works and what doesn't. And, um, no, the, 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 if you don't like it, turn the channel. Okay. But, but are, that's, are, that's you, are you, are you worried about the person that, the are you worried about the person that comes up with the idea or the person that writes it or the person that funds that kind of movie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about the person. I'm curious about all of them, really. All the, all the actors I mean, the who audition for it. it if they think... <laughs> well... No, I won't put any, because as an, a struggling actor, I've auditioned for things that are supremely questionable, but, you know, sometimes desperate times call for desperate auditions. But, uh, no, yeah, maybe it's the guy that, that comes up with the idea. The person that finances it, I mean, they're just a money person, and they see that there's money to be made on it, but who comes up with that idea? <laughs> My God. I mean, I don't know whether to lock them up or, or give them an award for, for thinking so far outside the box that, yeah, no, I, I, I almost want to see it just to satisfy that curiosity of how do you make a movie? Oh, you haven't seen it before? No, God, no. I, don't, oh. I have no intention of seeing it because it's... Okay, fine. What, like, horrifying... watch the first one. It's not scary. It's not scary. It's just really weird. I'm not. Weird. I'm not worried about being scared. I love being scared. I just uh, let's not talk about human sense. Okay. Just, <laughs> I, I brought it up. Fair <laughs> enough. So, what's what's the most questionable thing you've auditioned for? <laughs> oh man, commercials mostly. The commercials are the most pride swallowing auditions uh, that you can have because it's so over the top. It's so ridiculous. If you're a guy, you're typically the stupid guy who, you know, I did a commercial like that once because, you know, you, you need the money and and I'm the dumb husband who doesn't know how to, you know, mow the lawn or something. And it's just, it's so steeped in cliche and stereotypes and it's over the top theatrical. It's so over the top, it would it'd be out of place on the stage. And it's just, you know, they're typically not well written and they're, they're not funny. And uh, I shouldn't be saying these things because one day I might have to keep doing commercial <laughs> bills. But, but commercial auditions are the most gut wrenching experiences. I read you're an avid photographer and traveler and you are on the verge of acquiring your pilot's license. Are you just going to organize your next holiday by yourself, including the flight? Like, wh- wh- what's the point of. With Nab- Putting all these things nice? together, <laughs> you just want to—you uh, well, just want to get away from people completely. The same plan. <laughs> yeah, right. Wouldn't that be just heaven? <laughs> um, no, there is something to that with, with flying because you're you're up there by yourself and you're literally there's 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 no soul around you for for such a distance, and it's I mean it's loud with the engine, but. You've got your your earphones on, and uh, you're, you uh, you're in complete control of 
of your destination. Your your life literally is in your hands, and um, it's very meditative. Uh, but yeah, I um. Somebody asked me this recently, and I just said that I'm, I'm hyper aware of, of the passage of time. And there's, you know, we all have our bucket list. And uh, the moment that you have the luxury of, of employment as an actor, um, you can kind of indulge these, these, these things you've always wanted to do. And um, as long as I'm employed, I will keep knocking off these, these lists, these, these Bucket list items. So what's next? Um, I don't know what's next. I think I'm waiting to hear if we get picked up for season three, and then I'll decide. But it could be <laughs> anything from running with the bulls to... Coming to Australia. To coming to Australia and, uh, you know, diving to see sharks. I think that would be a blast. <laughs> I also read that in your graduation year book you wrote see you in the movies were you were you one of the more confident students in your year well i guess you had that comedy background as well so that was part of it (laughs) yeah no but i think confidence putting lightly i i i'd venture to say i was damn right cocky cocky yep um but when i graduated from high school i had no idea how i was going to do it and i think it was just a funny saying and if life turned out how I hoped it would, then, yeah, I might be in a movie one day. And uh, I think within seven years, I was. So, yeah, it was just blind confidence. <laughs> do, you still, do you still have that yearbook? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've got it. It's, you know, at my parents' place in storage, but... Uh, Oh, I was I was yeah, gonna say that out to me, uh, can you, in the early days of IMDb. Can you take a picture of that quote and send it to Casey and I'll put it up on my website along with your interview. Oh sure. Yeah, I could find a copy of that. That'd Absolutely. be awesome. And one of the, the the final main question is in the information I got sent about you, I read you have an affinity for Harrison Ford. Why him and have you ever met him? Yeah. And by the way, he is in one of my favorite movies of all time, so I can understand. What movie is that? Uh, Air Force One. I'm a sucker for kind of oh, plane right? movies. Plane movies, train movies, yeah. anything that, that is kind of like uh, an attack on a kind of a moving vehicle, I'm a sucker for it. And Air Force One did it really well. Yeah, it really did. All except for the actual crash of Air Force One. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. That was in the early days of CGI, and it was so out of place. And when the you see the, the, you, you see so the people bad. parachuting out of the plane, and they're just like going off screen, it brings back memories of the old Batman and Robin, the original series. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, totally. And them climbing up a wall. Yeah, then, then of Batman um, trying to fight off a, a rubber shark in the helicopter. <laughs> oh, that, yes. Yeah, wasn't that the one where all the villains were in the... Wasn't it the movie? I'm, I can't remember. That's anyway, the only yeah, scene I remember from forward. that series. That's the funny one of the funniest scenes I've okay. ever seen in a Hollywood-made production. Just this Batman in tight clothes yeah. trying to fight off this rubber shark that's got a hold of his leg. <laughs> and he's trying to climb back into the helicopter. Anyway, so why Harrison Ford? I'll have to look up that clip. Why Harrison Ford? Uh, because... In those informative years when I was, you know, studying Chevy Chase, um, I was watching Raiders of the Lost Ark. And here was, you know, my introduction to what's known as the reluctant hero. Not the superhero guy who jumps headfirst into danger to save everyone's life because of his, you know, unquestionable morals. But here's a guy who just doesn't want to be here, <laughs> but has to, and gets his ass kicked like a normal human being. And uh, and through sheer luck and will, manages to save the day. But he he was a guy that I could relate to. He was my dad. He was my dad's friends. He was just just a a guy <laughs> in the wrong place at the wrong time. And Harrison Ford exudes charm he's he's just he's a hero of mine and uh i've never met him 
and I, you know, they always say don't meet your heroes, and you know, I, I kind of, I, I understand that saying. I'd still like to shake his hand one day and say thank you because if it wasn't for Harrison Ford, I wouldn't be an actor uh, because I wanted to be him. I wanted to do the movies that he did. I wanted to to have that charm and uh, bravado that he exudes. It still does. Um, yeah, he's he's the template of, of what I wanted to be. Um, and I won't ever be that, but I'll be something different. I'll be Patrick Gilmore. But a lot of that is influenced by what Harrison Ford has done uh, for film. Well, Star Wars is making a huge comeback, so you can try and get a gig in that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I think there'll be Star Wars movies for, you know, the rest of our lives, so, yeah. you know, hopefully there'll be an opportunity for me to yeah, no, just I'm, pop I'm, in one as a stormtrooper. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a real sucker for, like terrorist attacks on moving vehicles like the taking of Pelham 123 was a great movie there was a great one by Liam Neeson on a plane in the last few years it might have been called Unbreakable or something like that it wasn't called Unbreakable I can't remember what it was called but it was on a plane and he was an undercover agent but just attacks oh, right yeah, yeah. Th- just movies about attacks when they're when they're on moving vehicles but the good guys always win and and ones yeah. about the president ones yeah, that involve the president being attacked as well siege. Ones that involve what? The president being attacked as well, so... Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God. Like, so, uh, what was that one, London Has Fallen? Or yeah, something? yeah, Olympus Has Fallen. I've watched both of them. There's another one coming out next Olympus. year, I think. That was great. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah no, uh, Air Force One has both of them, so that's why it's the perfect movie. It has the president and a terrorist attack, so, yeah. Yeah, See, Actually, I think I might uh, put that on my laptop uh I'm going to rewatch that movie. That's a great movie. <laughs> so I kind of like comedy. And watch I like... The Mosquito Coast. If, if you like Harrison Ford, watch The Mosquito Coast from, I think it was 1986. Mosquito the Coast. The role that he's not, you know, he's, he's actually the antagonist of the movie, but it's, 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 such, it's one of my favorite roles of his. Oh, God, is, is this the human centipede of Harrison Ford movies? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. No, River Phoenix is in it, Martha Plimpton. <laughs> Helen Mirren, it's a, it's a gorgeous movie. Yeah, yeah. So Peter F- Weir directed it. And isn't he an Aussie? Who? Peter Weir. I'm not sure. I haven't heard that name before. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm. I'm. I he might be Australian, but anyway, look look it up. Okay. I'll, <laughs> um. Yeah. I'll I'll look up afterwards. But um. Yeah, so Air Force One has that perfect mix of president and terrorist attacks. So I like comedy, and I like like full-on terrorist attacks and FBI kind of stuff, so I'm, I'd like a mix of things. I'm a bit weird like that, but yeah, anyway. <laughs> There's, yeah, any, so <laughs> finally, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Patrick Gilmore. Uh, that's G I L M O R E, and Instagram same thing at Patrick Gilmore, and uh, I have a Facebook page as well. But uh, if you find one, it'll link you back to the others. But, uh, and Snapchat. <laughs> uh, I'm always online. Snapchat, which I rarely use, but Instagram, Twitter are my my uh, go tos. Are you are you on like Twitch and I don't know LinkedIn, IMDb? <laughs> I think I'm on everything, but. <laughs> I I, 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 yeah. I think I'm on everything, but I didn't create everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, none of this is mine. Patrick, it's been an absolute pleasure. I'll let you go now because we have been on the phone for quite a while, and I'm sure you have other things to do with your afternoon. There's things on Netflix that need to be watched. So have a great afternoon. Thank you for yep. the interview, and good luck for Season 2 of Travelers. I hope you don't get too bombarded by tweets come December 27. Oh, I look forward to the tweets. Bring them on. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much for the, uh, for the time.